Welcome everyone to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This is episode 37. And today we are joined by Dr. James Mallinson, who is reader in Indology and Yoga Studies at SOAS, the University of London. Jim, welcome back to the Yogic Studies Podcast. How are we doing today? Thanks, Seth. Yeah, I'm doing well. Good to be back. How are you? You're all, all well in California? Yeah, things are going very well here. We had a nice um, uh, Thanksgiving here uh, last week and uh, settling back in, getting some good dissertation writing done these days, as we were just chatting about. You'll be pleased to know. Excellent. But uh, very excited to have you back. This is actually our third episode. Um, we had Jim on back uh, at the beginning of the podcast, uh, episode number five. And then last year, episode number 27, uh, you, when you taught previous courses for us, one on the uh, really the history of Hatha Yoga, and then last year you taught on the Amrita Siddhi. And now to, to begin 2023, you're going to be teaching another course for us on the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. So excited to have you teach again and you know, pleasure to welcome you back to the podcast to, to get to talk again. And uh, so for folks, well, you know, for folks who want to dive more into Jim's story and get a little bit more background, I encourage you to go back and listen to episode five, uh, where we, you know, talk in great detail about Jim's biography and how he got into Indology and, and yoga studies. Um, let's see. So it's kind of fun to get to have this podcast with you almost once a year now i get to sort of check in with you and and, and find out about the latest you know research you know coming out of out of soas so i know you guys are still you know uh, you've finished the hatha yoga project and now you're working on the hatha pradipika project uh, so tell us a little bit about about that and where things stand and sort of uh, what what you've been up to in terms of research this past year Okay, well, the, well, you say we finished the Hatha Yoga project. Formally, it's finished, but there's still plenty of outputs that need completing, one of which is the edition of the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Um, but a lot of the texts that we have edited or are editing as part of that were used to compile the Hatha Pradipika. Okay, so which we I mean, we've identified at least 20, I think more than 20 now, texts that went into that, and at least about half of the text is is drawn from others probably more i think um and that project is going really well if you'd asked me about a year ago or we well, probably did but i may have may have been a bit uh, less confident because you know at the beginning of these these things it's always quite hard to see the the wood for the trees particularly when you've got 200 manuscripts to deal with um but particularly the marburg side of the team so it's a joint project between soas and marburg and uh, there they're doing great great work like sorting out the different groupings of the witnesses and we've identified the best kind of early group so we quite often you know if, if in doubt we go with the readings from that group and we've got working editions of three of the four chapters we've been reading those through uh yeah and it's it's shaping up shaping up very well and there's, there's another project i'm on as well i don't know if i if, if you know about this one but with jason also jason birch uh, together with Professor Shaman Hatley at um, University of Massachusetts in Boston. So it's this, in similar in a way, because it's a, that one's a critical edition of a text called the Yoga Chintamani, which mm. also includes quotations from loads of earlier works, including the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Um, but really, it's the work on the Hatha Yoga project, like doing editions of these earlier texts, which makes it much more feasible to do the work on these on the Hatha Pradipika and the yoga chintamani yeah and so do we have a timeline in sight for the hatha pradipika i know folks are excited to you know obviously you're still you're still working on uh, finishing the the uh the text from the hatha yoga project uh yoga bija jason's working on and dot dot tre yoga shastra um but uh, for the Hatha Pradipika, um, any any timeline there on completion? Well, there actually, I'm more confident. We've got more sort of uh, we've got better time management, I think, coming up, particularly from the German side of the team. And we have a firm deadline for the end of the project, which is the uh, end of next year, end of 2023. Okay. So I'm pretty confident we'll have a, a working edition. It's going to be you know, we're going to produce a book because we're 
we're all still of the firm opinion that you know you really need a a, a solid book in case the whole internet and all the digital systems go down one day but you never know what might happen but there will be an online digital edition as well which is quite exciting because particularly with something like the Hatra Pradipika there are so many different versions of it different recensions you know we're looking at these extra passages that different groups of manuscripts insert uh, so we can it's it's a lot easier to um, put them into an online digital edition you know you can just there'll be a button where you can click you know do you want the extra passages or not or do you want mm. just the bare bones basic recension so we'll be doing that and yeah I'm I'm confident that we'll have something out certainly certainly by early 24 I'd have thought yeah yeah fantastic uh, that'll be great to have both the digital edition and and the printed book um, so with the Hatha Pradipika you mentioned that um, there's 20 or more of these texts that the author Svatmarama himself is drawing on. And so having established critical editions of those earlier texts has, you know, enabled, you know, better work on the Hatha Pradipika. So one of those texts is what we're going to talk about today is the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. I know you've been working on this text for, for a long time. Um, tell us a little bit about you know the like just the project of working on this text you know it's it's manuscripts um how maybe how how big is this text it's a little bit smaller than than the hatha pradipika or some of these other texts right so tell us a little bit yeah. about just the nature of working on this text um maybe it's manuscript history and a little bit of just the background on you know working on the critical edition and then the translation of it well, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said that oh, I'll have it all finished by in a, in a year, in, in a year or so. But I'm really beginning to think I should have learned my lesson actually way back when I did my PhD and I and I started the project of editing this text, the Kitri Vidya, which is about Kitri Mudra. Um, I thought I was only going to find six, maybe seven manuscripts. Those are the ones I could find catalogued, and I ended up with thirty. Or something rather similar has happened with the Data Treya Yoga Shastra. I don't know how many manuscripts I've got in total. It must be about 15, I should think, something like that. Um, but I found in the last year or so, probably year, year and a half, realized that it's catalogued under another name, the mm. Data Tre Sanghita. Okay. Oh. And confusingly, there is another text called the Data Tre Sanghita, which has nothing to do with it. So I looked at one of those, thought, okay, this is a different text. And then for some reason or other, looked at a different version of it and realized that actually it's exactly the same as the text I've been calling the Data Treya Yoga Shastra uh, and has much better readings. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally the, generally the same, although there's one passage on Vajroli, we might say a bit about that, which is a bit longer. But yeah, as I as I looked at the first witness of, of that, which was in a in a, a script called uh, Nandi Nagari, mm -hmm. and which is relatively easy to read if you know Devanagari, but it became pretty clear that it had lots of really good readings and I'd need to collate the other manuscripts as well. And uh, and they're all in Grunta, so this South Indian uh, script that's used, you know, it's quite like modern Tamil and it's used for writing Sanskrit. And I have I have collated manuscripts in the past, but not for a long time. And that, you know, that's definitely, that's like kind of, you know, that really slowed things up a bit. I can pick up a David Nagri manuscript and read it very quickly. But I mean, my grunt is now quite a lot better than it was a year or so ago. But I spent a lot of the last year working on those those manuscripts. Um, anyway, it's all done, finally. I'm just, well, there's a long section in the uh, in the introduction. God, it takes so long writing these things up of like describing the different witnesses, the different manuscript witnesses. And there are a few. I've drawn a line now. I'm pretty confident that you know, you get a kind of law of diminishing returns after a point where right. each manuscript you collate doesn't really add much mm -hmm. and you have to just draw a line at some point. But also not only are there all these manuscripts of the text itself, but it's quoted in lots of other texts. So, it's, you know, we know, well, sometimes it's just stolen, you know, plagiarized, we might say these days, but I don't think it wasn't, you know, that wasn't such a big deal in the in, in pre-modern India. So the Hatha Pradipika, for example, has about 40 verses from it um so those are also useful for reconstructing the text and then i mean i used to think i've been thinking about this recently i i'm not sure but i mean it would i still want to do it to some extent and i will do it in an upcoming monograph but trying to map the relationships of all the different hutta texts but it becomes so complicated because you know you get you get things like so the hutta pradipika will borrow a 
we'll take a verse from the Data Treya Yoga Shastra and then maybe change it or, or it just gets changed in the transmission of the Hatha Pradipika. Mm-hmm. And then a later stream of transmission of the Data Treya Yoga Shastra, you could tell that the scribe is also looking at one of these Hatha Pradipika manuscripts and changes mm-hmm. it back. So it just becomes an absolute. I mean, I think you go mad if you try to make full sense of it. It's just absolute chaos. So tracing it but often often seeing those links is useful in trying to make sense sense of the text yeah i think i think a lot of folks will probably be you know much more familiar with the text like the hatha pradipika and some of these verses that people maybe take for granted that this is a this is a unique verse from spot marama that this is actually from the data treya yoga shastra so it's then when you read the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, you go, oh, this looks really familiar. And it's interesting to see that verse in its own kind of native textual environment. But, you know, quotes like uh, something like, you know, whether young or old, uh, weak or decrepit, anyone who practices Hatha Yoga will attain success. Something, just paraphrasing there a bit, but... Uh, something like that that you find in the Hatha Pradipika actually belongs to the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. Is that right? Yeah, that's right indeed. I think there's an extra bit to it, isn't there? There's another line about you also that really interesting thing about you know basically saying any religion as well. well right. Within the scope of of what was going on there, but talking about sort of Karpalikas and you know, these skull bearing ascetics and Buddhists and Jains and then even Charvakas, so kind of like atheists. You know, there's that that's a really interesting line there where he says um you know that it doesn't matter as long as you practice you will get wherever you it is that you want to go i mean where an atheist wants to get to is another question we might raise or a child of Arca. you know what's the religious aim for someone like that but yeah. um says pretty clearly that anyone you know anyone can benefit from practicing yoga so this is Dattatreya's yoga shastra yoga discourse or yoga scripture text um who is Dattatreya and you know what what is the significance of this being attributed to Dattatreya um how does this relate to sort of the question of of the authorship of the text right these teachings are being attributed to this figure Dattatreya is Dattatreya the author what can we say about the author um and what can we say about Dattatreya and, and what that might tell us maybe about the religious or, you know, the, the spiritual context or milieu, you know, of this yoga text? Yeah, well, the, the text itself, I mean, is is very interesting, very significant, I think, in that it is the first text to present teachings on Hatha yoga, on physical yoga, that's not from a kind of tantric Shaiva or Buddhist uh, tradition. So it's a Vaishnava, it's clearly a Vaishnava text. There are lots of lots mm-hmm. of signs. So, so you know, the, 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 of a text for and by followers of Vishnu. And Dattatreya, in lots of systems, it's not that well known these days, but there's very common systems of uh, incarnations or lists of incarnations of Vishnu that include Dattatreya. Mm-hmm. It was a very popular system of uh, 24 I mean, nowadays, of course, the system of 10 avatars or, or incarnations of Vishnu has become really prominent, but there were various other systems. So I mean, Data Tre is very clearly uh, associated with a kind of Vaishnava, but at the same time, not altogether orthodox tradition. So mm-hmm. there's a text that's slightly earlier than the Data Tre Yoga Shastra, the, the Markandeya Purana, which uh, has, as, I haven't read it for a while, but I think it goes at a you know, a group of young Brahmin sages hear about this great master yogi, Dattatreya, and they want to go and learn from him. Mm. And he, you know, he can't, can't be bothered to teach them. So he, you know, from from afar, they, when they can see him, he's, he just starts drinking and making love to women and, and so forth. Because, mm. and then it said in the text, he's such a kind of advanced yogi. It doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't touch him. You know, he's trying to put off these these Brahmin prospective Brahmin students by misbehaving. Uh, but eventually, you know, he he, uh, he agrees and uh, and teaches them. So he, I think he's the ideal vehicle for this text because of that sort of slightly unorthodox uh, sort of a tinge to his personality. And the way the text is structured, so it is presented as his teachings. This The, the sage Sankriti goes to the, and finds Dattatra. He's been wandering the whole world looking for, for yoga unsuccessfully and then finds Dattatreya meditating under a mango tree 
uh, surrounded by his 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 disciples and students and then he asks him to teach him yoga and and, and he does and he then frames it datatreya in there's four different types of yoga so and i'm pretty sure he's you know he's drawing this from a text called the amaraga which mm-hmm. is a little bit earlier um but this system of four yoga so there's mantra yoga laya yoga hatha yoga and raja yoga and but he's more kind of um he's quite acerbic the author so the, you asked about the authorship now obviously as scholars we can't say it was that our a revelation divine revelation it's some human author i'm thinking now i'm actually putting the date back a little bit or yeah, a bit earlier to about 1200 um and it's I'm, i mean i'm pretty sure he's drawing on earlier texts i said the amaraga and the viveka martanda as well as another text i reckon he draws on um but he composes all his own verses. You know, he doesn't just copy and paste like you see in the Arta So there's mm-hmm. clearly, you know, there's quite a lot of thought going into the, how this is put together. Um, so you've got the mantra yoga, which he's pretty disparaging about. It's basically kind of tantric practice. And he's kind of says that only the lowliest types bother with this and you won't get very far with it. and It'll take you a long time. Uh, then you've got laya yoga. And that, he says, is taught by uh, Shiva in this um in his form as shabaresha so this kind of mountain forest uh, form of of shiva who teaches it to his his followers in all these kind of on all these mountain tops uh and that's made up of these sanketas these funny little esoteric sort of very simple practices that are said to bring about laya so dissolution and um and one of those is is actually shavasana it's not called shavasana but it's a forerunner of Shavasana. In fact, we can see that Swatmarama in the Hatha Pradipika, that's the first text to teach the corpse pose. And he clearly takes this description of Laya Yoga, the, the Sanketa of Laya, from the Dathatreya Yoga Shastra and then turns it into this asana, Shavasana. So there's these kind of six or seven esoteric methods. But then the bulk of the text follows that, and that's on Hatha Yoga. Uh, and... This is where it gets really interesting for the history of yoga because this is the first time that we see the Ashtanga, so the eightfold system of yoga, first made famous by Patanjali. Mm-hmm. It's the first time we see it uh, together with physical practices of Hatha Yoga. And he does a, a, a funny thing. So he, first of all, in fact, the largest section of the text, I mean, much the most, the biggest part of the whole text is this is the section on Hatha Yoga. Yeah, I think it's something like 160 out of 190 verses, something like mm. that. So it's you know huge, almost all of the text, or 150 maybe. Um, and he says so he introduces the Ashtanga type, which he said he attributes to Yagya Vulkya, so this ancient Vedic Rishi. And then it corresponds, you know, then he teaches the eight Ungas, uh, and they're you know they're the same Ungas, but they're definitely it's definitely not the same not taught in exactly the same way as Patanjali, and they're all very interesting in their own right. And then he says, there's another way of doing this that was taught by Kapila, okay, mm-hmm. someone altogether different. Uh, and then he teaches these nine uh, practices of Hatha Yoga, which later get uh, denoted, later get grouped together under the name Mudra. Uh, but here that's not a kind of generic name for them, they're just taught all together. But again, um, Kapila is an interesting choice. And mm. similar to Dattatreya, because he's also found in these early lists of 24 or sometimes more incarnations of Vishnu. And he's also quite a, you know, heterodox ascetic practitioner, really from early times. I mean, Johannes Bronckhorst has written quite a lot about this. But he, you know, in his, it, we, we people might know him as a, a, t- a teacher of Sankhya, but he's mm-hmm. also... He crops up in all kinds of, of, of very early texts, and often he's identified as an asura, you know, which is like you know opposed to the devas, to the gods, and he's seen as 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 uh, propagating a kind of unorthodox, heterodox uh, practice that leads to enlightenment, as opposed to you know he's in, in tension with the the Vedic traditions that that uh, are not so keen on uh, renouncing the world and and going for for enlightenment. Um, and in fact, yeah, there's a there's a, funny enough in a text I translated a long time ago for the Clay Sanskrit Library. There's this this verse where they're approaching the city, Chanda Singh has city, some pilgrims or something. I can't remember what exactly what the context is, and they say something about the city that there, um, 
uh, people do people like Kapila do practices uh, that in search of moksha that would you know turn turn everyone actually horrify the the orthodox brahmins and so forth so he too like Dattatreya, is associated with doing slightly kind of sketchy but at the same time in somehow in this sort of mainstream vedic orthodox framework so they're the perfect characters mm. incorporating these new practices of physical yoga into a kind of orthodox system so i think that you know that, that, that's why they're chosen if we can say they were chosen but then you know it just seems extremely uh, appropriate that it should be Dattatreya and and Kapila. That's very interesting. You know, I, I've long been wondering about, you know, why those figures and this this interesting presentation of two types of Hatha Yoga, one attributed to Yajnavalkya and one to Kapila. Uh, it, it makes sense what you're saying. On the one hand, it, it, it kind of places these perhaps new techniques, these new, this new, newer Hatha Yoga, but it it authenticates it within a guise of kind of Vedic orthodoxy of, of tradition by associating it with these figures, but not just any figures, as you said, ones that are slightly more heterodox or even antinomian. That's that's quite interesting. The other thing is that Ashtanga yoga here is being equated with Hatha yoga. So he's teaching a type of Hatha yoga that is eightfold it is eight angas so this is something i'm i'm exploring as well because this is how hatha yoga is presented in the shiva yoga pradipika and i'm actually more and more convinced it's it's taking it here from the dattatreya yoga shastra in 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 this capacity um but it's interesting to point out that this ashtanga yoga is not being attributed to patanjali as you said so I think most people today associate this Ashtanga Yoga with the Yoga Sutra and Patanjali. But uh, I think as David Gordon White pointed out in his uh, book, The Biography of the Yoga Sutra, um, it's pretty rare, if ever, in these later yoga texts, Puranas or these medieval yoga texts, that we see specific references to Patanjali um, that Although Ashtanga Yoga is mentioned in Puranas and in this yoga literature, it's more often Yajnavalkya or other Vedic sages. Does, does that um, kind of confirm with your reading of, of these texts that Patanjali is pretty rarely mentioned uh, in relation yeah, to I, Ashtanga Yes, I mean, yoga? the exception, the, the obvious exception are the sort of scholarly compendia and commentaries where they will cite. Mm -hmm. Patanjali's Yoga Shastra, but yeah, my right. impression is that within this this sort of tradition, and probably within other traditions too, you know, the tradition of the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra within that tradition, Patanjali's not seen as a practitioner. You know, he's not he's not seen as the yogi. He's the scholar who kind of codified it all. So I think there's a difference, and that's why these practices are attributed to Yogya Valkya, who I think, in the understanding of the of the composer of the text, he would have practiced them rather than being the sort of codifier or however you might put it but there's an interesting <clears throat> there's an interesting conundrum which you know like i, I said that you know you, you sense a a skillful clever mind behind this text mm -hmm. but there's one bit which i haven't quite made sense of and maybe when we're reading it and i'll be we'll be thinking about this again because it's pretty crucial to our understanding of what's going on and that's that so at the end of the section on the ashtanga yoga of, of yagya valkya uh the text says but there's another sort kapila did hatha in a different way right okay and that's that introduces the new way and then he says something like the you know the there's a difference in practice but the results are the same so it seems to be a choice you know it seems to be like either you can do the ashtanga of of yagya valkya and or, or or you can do the, the the these nine um hatha practices of of kapila Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about that and then recently sort of looking into the structure of the text and how it's put together. He incorporates idea in the same way that he incorporates the four types of yoga. He also incorporates this system of four stages first taught in the Amrita Siddhi. But I think he's probably getting it from the Amarauga as well. But the, the strange thing there is that A, the, they are only applied to the Hatha bit. Okay. Even though when he introduces yoga, he says there are these four types of yoga and there are four stages to yoga. But the stages are only used to 
uh, sort of demarcate um, places within the Ashtanga system of Yagavalkya and then mm. the nine practice system of Kapila. Now, the strange thing is where 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 I kind of where it doesn't compute for me is that those four stages they go across that boundary. So I think you reach the end of the first stage, Arambha. Mm -hmm. uh, after Pratyahara, maybe I can't remember Dharana, somewhere around that, mm. and then the next stage, which is um, Ghata, happens I think early on in the nine practices of Kapila, and then the next one Parichaya is maybe after five or six of, and, and so that really implies that you have to do both systems. Do you see what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. the stages run across the Ashtanga and then into Kapila's system, suggests yeah. that you've got to do first of all Ashtanga. And then couple of the system, which doesn't really make sense, doesn't really compute to me, because at the end of the Ashtanga, you've got Samadhi. So there, that's one bit where I either I feel I'm misunderstanding it, or he's kind of just trying to shoehorn too many different things in and hadn't quite thought it through. But anyway, yeah. something something we could think about. In the Shiva Yoga Pradipika, yes. it takes the four stages and it and it just clearly maps them onto the four yogas. So mantra yoga is the first stage the aramba you know then laya hatha uh, and then raja yoga is the nishpati the the completion oh. right so you have uh, to do all four different yogas i guess so or yeah yeah skip one if you're yeah but it it kind of it reintegrates those four yogas in different ways within the ashtanga yoga schema itself you know so mm. so mantra yoga becomes um the Soham, the Ajapa Gayatri during guess, the yeah. Pranayama section and things like that. Um, so maybe the author of my text was trying to, you know, make it a little bit more clear. You know, you take these, you know, four and four and put them together, puts them with four yeah. stages of Pranayama. But that's, yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting challenge i see what you're saying i think he does it does seem pretty clear he's saying there's two different systems here and you can do either and they'll they'll produce the same results but i think do, do do you get the sense that some of these authors they're taking these pieces from different texts and different different systems and then they're trying to they're trying to reconcile them they're trying to put them together in new ways and sometimes they seem to fit squarely and sometimes they sort of have rough edges or bleed over and those those things kind of stand out to us today sure yeah and i think it's even more so with um swatma rama and the Hatha pradipika you know he's trying to mm. fit a lot a lot of material in and sometimes there are it's not altogether coherent yeah i did i did want to ask you more about just this ashtanga yoga i, I think it is significant you said what did you say that this is the first text that uses ashtanga yoga like that framework the eight limbs or ungas to teach hatha yoga many of the other hatha yoga texts including the hatha pradipika they don't use an unga system to structure the practices um other some some texts do like the yoga yagnavalkya which is also interesting given its maybe you know its name and potential relation here um and the shiva yoga pradipika another one um but but many of them don't so do you have any thoughts about why texts use an unga framework or don't um you know why why some of these teach hatha yoga as ashtanga yoga and then others uh, yeah other, others don't well i think i think by um by teaching it as Ashtanga or you know, using that framework in any way, they're definitely sort of signaling allegiance to a more orthodox tradition, you know, because by that point, Patanjali had become, you know, the author of the Yoga Darshana and so forth. Meanwhile, you know, more Shaiva tantric influenced texts such as the Viveka Maratanda, later known as the Goraksha Shataka, but there's a different Goraksha Shataka anyway, it's confusing, but that's from a uh, you know, Shaiva Tantric tradition that teaches the the sixfold, the Shadanga Yoga, which is very common in uh, earlier Shaiva Tantras. So I think in that way you see a certain allegiance to you know, either you're coming from this Tantric Shaiva system, or or you're coming from a more mainstream. But also uh, the Ashtanga system you find in these Vaishnava uh, 
influenced or Vaishnava denomination text such as the Yoga Yagi Valka that you mentioned, which takes a lot of its uh, verses from the Vasishta Sangita, an earlier uh, Vaishnava work, which I think actually probably draws on the Data Treya Yoga Shastra. So there, there's some relationship going on there. But yeah, I think, you know, a simple rule of thumb is that if a text is talking about Ashtanga Yoga, it's more Vedic mainstream than, than one that isn't. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting. Um, I think I think that that's likely true. So, uh, how how long is the Dattatre Yoga Shastra? About how many how many verses? Well, it just got longer <laughs> <laughs> because, which actually means I've now got to go through the long introduction and and because I, I, yeah, there was a. The, the the southern manuscripts I was talking about they have this longer much longer section on Vajroli Mudra mm. which I'm pretty convinced was original mm -hmm. okay so I've had to reshape the text you know that section is more like 30 verses maybe in the previous recension that I've and had and is been... that is that part of the um the Kapila teachings on Hatha Yoga yes yeah yeah so that's the last of the nine practices of the Kapila um so with that, it brings the total number of verses to 192, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, the annoying thing is I now have to go through the introduction and find all the, everywhere where I've said, you know, this verse is borrowed from there, blah, 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 and mm -hmm. check the numbers because mm -hmm. the numbers have all changed. So that will drive me a bit crazy. But yeah, 192. Uh, as I said, the, the longest section is the Ashtanga section, which has some, you know, really interesting teachings on Pranayama. I think it's the first, yes, yeah, the first text, I reckon, to introduce this distinction between the Sahita and Kevala Kumbhakas, mm. so methods of breath retention, the one in which you know you have a controlled inhalation and exhalation, whereas Kevala, you know, you can spontaneously hold your breath for long periods whenever you want. And that then gets taken up in subsequent texts, including the Vastishta Sanghita. Uh, interesting elemental dharanas, so meditation, sort of fixations on the um, on the five elements. Um and yeah and then but then the the next longest section is Kapila's nine practices of which the longest is uh the Vajroli section yeah and you should probably give a content warning as well for people signing up to the course because it gets pretty graphic actually and still quite obscure we've only got because it's only found in the southern manuscripts and two of the southern manuscripts break off just before that passage so we've only got three witnesses for it they quite often disagree. It's quite often hard to make sense of. But it's very interesting. So Vajroli is this practice of, you know, sucking up fluids through the, the gentle organs, but whether you're a, a man or a woman, it's said to be possible by both. And it has a long, you know, well, a long sort of eight, eight or ten verses on how women do it, which is quite unusual. You know, we don't find right. that. Right. And, and the text, there's 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 a couple of verses that, I mean, that speak to female practitioners, right? It says the male practitioner should seek, uh, you know, a, a female who is an adept in yoga, which assumes that at the time that there that there were. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One of the few, one of the few texts it is, and this one actually now with this extra passage, it has instructions. I mean, we get a little bit in the Arta Pradipika, but this is more extensive. This is longer, and it has, you know, quite developed uh, instructions for the female practitioner. Which but they're annoying. they are they're really aimed at preserving and retaining bindu right at the end of the day yeah but for the woman it's it's uh the same but with rajas so right. the sort of the feminine equivalent yeah but i mean yeah it's i won't won't claim to have made complete sense of it um as as people will highlight when we read it you know there are mm. some various complications but the kind of general gist is 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 pretty clear so would you say these teachings in this text, are they mostly aimed at ascetic renunciates um, or are householders also included? I know that there, it does seem that there's a shift that they're trying to be more inclusive to non-ascetic practitioners at times, but then you also have this intense focus on the retention of Bindu. Um, so what, what do you make of that these days? Yeah. As we read it again, I can't remember if it explicitly says that householders come. I don't think it does in the Data Treya Yoga Shastra. I think it's basically aimed at celibate ascetics. But then there's this, you know, this kind of uh, chink, this the, the the thin end of the wedge, perhaps, which is uh, created by Vajroli, I think, 
um, in that after the Vajroli passage, it's ambiguous actually because it, the Vajroli is the last one of the nine practices. Um, and after that, it says by using these methods, and it may refer just to Vajroli, but it may mean all nine of Kapila's methods. Anyway, it says that, you know, you don't have to follow the normal rules. You can indulge yourself. You can, uh, you know, cultivate your senses, indulge, indulge your senses and still attain liberation, still attain the goal of yoga. And mm. that is kind of identified with Raja Yoga. So I have a theory, which I think I've discussed with you before, um, that I think that... Um, that this in in some way maybe because we know from inscriptional evidence and and some other sources that around this period the heads of monasteries were quite often known as raja yogis and uh, this is a term as she still used to this day and that uh, some of those heads of monasteries were not entirely celibate you know they would have wives and so, in some cases children so where that how that tallies with the bindu dharana i don't know with hanging on to the bindu but my my understanding now, and I will, I'd like to develop this further. In fact, in monograph, I'm going to, you know, I've got written quite extensively on this already, but not published it. Um, exploring this idea that one of the motivations, in fact, for the the the, uh, the teachings of these practices was justification of such roles, and it's you know, it sort of illustrates the tension between, uh, you know, the more ascetic, fully celibate traditions, and then these more worldly monastic heads and so forth we see it quite in you know there's um there's a guy called ludovico de vartema who was writing around 1500 and he writes about the the kadri mata down in uh near in, in mangalore today mm -hmm. and he talks about the king of the yogis there and you know he's got family and he rides around in amazing style with all these crazy animals and tigers and lions and elephants and followed by three thousand of his followers uh, amongst whom then you get the the you know, the ash clad loincloth wearing ascetics. So within the same tradition, you know, I think you will probably always had different styles, different modes of asceticism. And I think we can read that into the Data Tre Yoga Shastra. And yeah, sorry. And then to go back to, yeah, I don't, it doesn't really say address householders, but I think it's because of this kind of, um, this, like I said, the thin end of the wedge, this chink opened up by the notion of Raja Yoga and being able to live uh, without observing all the really strictest rules of, of yoga, that that kind of is a way to let householders in as well. You know, that's kind of opens it up to beyond, beyond purely, you know, full-time ascetics. I think I was thinking of this verse towards the end, but I'm looking at your, I think, 2013 edition. So it, uh, I don't know if it made the final cut, but uh, once was it one sixty six or one sixty seven? Uh, one sixty five. Um, <clears throat> yogins, you know, whether they are um, in forests or houses, um, who who practice these teachings, aranyeshu greheshuva. Um, it's saying it's kind of closing the text and it says, ah, yes, yeah. <clears throat> he, you know, one who regularly studies this text and teaches it to good people is sure to gradually obtain success in yoga. So, well, you'll get a good boon, Jim, for teaching <laughs> this text uh, to people at yogic studies. But then whether in forests or houses, yogins who are devoted to practice have lived happily for a long time. I mean, in some ways, this is sort of just kind of the yoga shastra rhetorics of kind of mm. waxing at the end of a text um hard to you don't want to read too much into that saying okay and everything that has been stated here now applies to people who are whether in forests or houses uh but there's just you know mentions casual mentions let's say things like that that um you know it, it's sort of similar to the type of language that when we see earlier you know, if diligent, everyone, even the young or the old or the diseased, there is this um, move towards a certain kind of inclusivity at times. At times, the text will sort of sound as if these practices are universal. They're for everyone and anyone, regardless of, um, you know, physiology, regardless mm -hmm. of uh, caste or, or religion. We had that verse, whether they're Brahmin, ascetic, Buddhist, Jain, Kapalika, Charvaka, so forth, whether they live in a forest or in a house.
But then at other times, these practices, once you get into the details of them and their specificity and what's required of them, especially with something like Vajroli or some of these other mudras, um, they seem less accessible. <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, like standing on your head for three hours a day or something. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's not everyone so, can yeah. take that time out. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess, you know, what, what do you make of that a little bit? On the one hand, there's, there's this kind of universalism and inclusivity. You've written about this, um, wanting these teachings to be kind of available to anyone, regardless of these type of backgrounds. And then on the other hand, they're, they're still pretty traditional ascetic practices, sometimes involving brahmacharya or different techniques to have this bindu dharana and, and other things. Uh, there's also, you know, the verses um, I think in the pranayama section about building the yoga hut and, you know, and this idea of the yoga matta that it should be secluded. It should be built away from other people, <laughs> you know, yeah, so that, that itself, hut. the environment for the practice is uh, supposed to be like an isolated, you know, retreat house. Um, so I'm just curious. This is the things that I'm I'm just thinking about, you know, in 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 my own reading of these texts. So I'm just curious if you do you see that that tension sometimes there in the text of the way they're kind of positioned. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right to identify that. And thanks for reminding me of the yeah the verse at the end, the Aran Yeshu and Guruheshuva, um, which yeah. certainly seems to say that you know, living in houses, you can still be a, a you know a master practitioner of, of yoga. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the, the overall flavor is that it's for ascetics, you know, living in huts. I think the pranayama you're meant to do four times, you know, four times a day for quite long periods. And like I say, standing on your head for or the viparita karani for three hours and these various things seem to require a, a, a pretty hardcore, devoted, dedicated ascetic lifestyle. But that the, there are these chinks there as well that seem to be making it available to all. I mean, the practice is about whether you're old or young, you know, diseased or not, they could apply to ascetics, I suppose. That could just be, you know, any any type of ascetic. But yeah, that, you're right. There does seem to be this sort of chink opening up. I mean, the, the only thing against that is that we have, you know, almost no or pretty much, you know, pretty much zero evidence of non-ascetics, sort of non-professionals doing these this kind of yoga in the pre-modern period. I mean, it may just be that it's not such an interesting story, um, but, you know, beyond, I mean, the one exception maybe is in sort of South Indian temple priests in their tantric texts, they're instructed to do yoga as part of the ritual, but ethnograph, ethnographic kind of research into that shows that they just sort of do that rather dismissively you know they don't really, do, it's just kind of go through the motions and they're not really doing yoga. So yeah, that's the yeah i mean i think you're right there just seem to be this live small allowance for potential householder practice but it's it's just a a small chink mm -hmm. and you mentioned you know this is a <clears throat> likely a vaishnava text um can you say a little bit more about why you think so and um what again just in context of those verses that there's this appeal to make this available to anybody. So it's the text is not saying that this is only for Vaishnavas necessarily, but yet there are there are some elements that suggest like a Vaishnava context. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, well, there's sort of the opening verse in both both recensions is clearly uh, these you know benedictory verses, Mangala verses is clearly to Vishnu, uh, and as I said before, Siddhartha Treya and Kapila are both incarnations of Vishnu. But yeah, it doesn't hammer it home. It doesn't bang the drum too too loudly. Um, and it says, you know, there's a, there's a, a great f funny passage, you know, where he's kind of talking about the different uh, sort of insignia and behaviours of aesthetics and how, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you do or what you wear and what you say, uh, you just got to practice. And some of the characteristics include you know, what, either saying Narayana or Nar Narayanaya, Om Namo Narayanaya is the kind of Vaishnava mantra. But then he also mentions Namaha Shivaya as well, you know, saying people mm -hmm. are going around saying this. As well. And I think what, you know, my, the, the, the way I think one can make sense of this is that 
even though it's produced in a uh, Vaishnava milieu, it's not meant to be exclusive. And I think what what we what we need one way of understanding this is that these texts were being put out by monastic institutions or some kind of religious denominations, uh, and but they weren't purely for their own own people. And these these monasteries, to a great extent, certainly during this period as well, when it was composed, they're really rising, they're really coming uh, to their ascendance, and they, um, they they functioned a bit like universities. So people would move from one to the other to study and so forth, and they would they would uh, educate people of different denominations. So yeah, they you know they put a bit of a stamp on some of these texts, but they don't want to bang the drum and with exclusivity and say you know you have to be a member of our gang to uh, do our yoga. Yeah. Great. Well, um, why don't we talk a little bit uh, about the course itself and uh, what students, you know, might might expect who want to join us uh, for this class? Can you see that? I can. That lovely image that you found of the Tatra, Yeah. All right. So we'll use that as a backdrop here to to talk a little bit uh, about the course, which is going to run. January 3rd through February 9th, 2023. Um, that'll be the live dates, but it will be available for self-study anytime after that. So it's a six-week course, and um, we'll meet twice a week for two live reading sessions with Jim. And um, you've finished the critical edition and the translation, right? And you'll be sharing that with students? I will. I will. I expect I'll be tweaking it a little bit as we read. It's not in quite so. When I did the Amrita Siddhi last year, it was pretty much, I think it had been submitted for publication, hadn't it? Or more or less. Or, uh -huh. So there wasn't any room for changes. But now I haven't submitted. I'm still working on the introduction. Uh, so we'll be reading that and I'll give an introductory session, give background to the text and so forth. But then basically we uh, pretty similar to what we did with Amrita Siddhi, which I really enjoyed, went really well. I'll read it verse by verse. I'll circulate both the critical edition in Devanagari, but also I've kind of extracted the the root text and put that in Roman, so it's easy to read for people who don't don't read Devanagari well, and the translation. And we'll go through it verse by verse, and I'll read the verse, translate, and then comment upon it. Um, you know, the, the best sort of uh, indological study, I think. You know, just close reading of a text, trying to make sense of it. Um, most of it's pretty clear, but there are a few knotty issues, which perhaps like last time people can help me um, thrash out, unravel. Um, you get a credit in the in the edition and the translation, that's for sure, if you give me good ideas about uh, how to make sense of it. And yeah, so we'll try, so 190, or they've got 12 sessions, so we'll probably do, but yeah, should be 18 a session, something like 18 or 20 per session. Um, with plenty of time for question and answer as well, each and and discussion as as we read. Fantastic, yeah. This is this is really just the best way to get to get to know a text. You know, to study it with a teacher like Jim, who's spent so many years working on the edition and translating it, and then with a dedicated group of students uh, to just get to, you know, spend twelve sessions going through it slowly, carefully. Even if it's a text that you've read before, although in this case, I actually, I, I, I really doubt that it is uh, because uh, there's not, you know, very well-known translations. Um, I guess there, there are some translations that exist of it, but not like this. And, um, uh, but nonetheless, just to get to read it uh, closely like this um, is uh, such a special experience for all of us. Uh, so, so we're looking, really looking forward uh, to this time. And, um, yeah, Jim, a anything else about the text or about the course, um, that you wanted to mention today as we kind of wind things down here? No, I think we've covered most of it. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to go do it again. Like I say, it's the, it's the kind of teaching I enjoy the most, I think just slowly quiet, you know, slowly reading a a yoga text doesn't get any better. Yeah, and a lesser known text, but really one of the key sources for Hatha Yoga, one of the key sources for the Hatha Pradipika of Svatmarama. Uh, as we mentioned, perhaps the first text to teach Hatha Yoga as part of an Ashtanga Yoga system. So 
So for people who are studying Ashtanga yoga systems and want to think about how a Hatha yoga practice fits within Ashtanga yoga, well, this is a text that was doing just that. Um, so for all these reasons uh, and more, yeah, we hope uh, you'll consider joining us. So thanks again, uh, Jim, so much for, for your time today and for sharing this, you know, this great work uh, and this text with us at Yogic Studies. Well, thank you very much, Seth. I've enjoyed, enjoyed chatting as ever, and I really look forward to, to the course. I mean, get, get me through the, the dark months of January and February. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone, for listening.